call the uh, okay. first meeting for uh, agriculture subcommittee number one to order. We have a uh, couple of administrative items first on a House Bill 14, Delegate Corey. She has asked us to strike the bill. So, so moved. Move. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. So it's okay. Please cast your vote. for the dog when it was taken into custody. 
Bill also sets conditions uh, on the ownership of a dangerous dog, including requiring the owner to obtain a registration certificate prior to return of the animal, uh, raising the renewal fee from $85 to $150, and removing the option of the owner to show that the dog is muzzled and confined in a fenced yard until a proper enclosure is constructed. Uh, the bill requires that the <coughs> mandatory uh, warning signs at an owner's residence be visible from any place along the property line. The animal uh, be fitted with a GPS tracking device. Uh, satisfactory confinement be locked. And the dog, uh, if the dog is taken out on a leash, uh, that the leash be no more than six feet long and uh, held by a person capable of controlling the dog. It also raises the minimum liability insurance coverage or bond uh, from the dog for from $100,000 to $300,000. Okay. Any questions to the delegate at this time? Delegate Lord. Yeah. Delegate Cole, just curious. Two issues in particular you raise it in the bill, and I'll start, I guess, with the second. The current law requires animals to be muzzled. Mm -hmm. Given that, that the muzzle is going to keep the animal from being able to bite another, why do we then also need to restrict the leash length? Uh, it, can, can you cite a circumstance where well, an animal has harmed another when they had a muzzle on? Well, the uh, mm -hmm. larger dogs uh, could still do damage even with a, a muzzle on, like the, the situation that uh, we're trying to deal with is a large dog and it. Uh, attacked an er elderly man and knocked him down. Uh, and so uh, you know, that is still, even if the dog is muzzled, and plus it's tough to, uh, to given some of the, the design of some of the muzzles, uh, from a distance it's tough to tell whether or not a dog is actually muzzled. I guess we'll follow up. And, and I understand, I guess I'm, because we're saying now it's got to be six foot. Mm -hmm can't be any longer, but I mean the key is if the if the dog is stronger than I am, and how do we determine that until after the dog has gotten loose from? It? Well, uh, how do you determine if a dog is dangerous or not until after it's attacked? There's been an act. Uh, one other question, and, and understand, I, I have concerns with your here in uh, 64, under no circumstances would the animal be able to return to the owner until the certificate had been obtained. Mm -hmm. There are cases where the initial finding of animal control is this a dangerous dog and, and we take custody, but then as it goes through the process, the animal may be deemed not to be mm -hmm. after court proceedings. So if I understand animal control would have to take custody, local government would have to absorb the expense of that. And, and specifically, I'm aware of a case there in our area mm -hmm. where <coughs> daughter was supposed to close the pin gates, didn't close it tight. Uh, I believe it was a, a lab or maybe a bird dog got loose, got down the road, and killed some chicken. Mm -hmm. By definition, that's a dangerous dog. The, the people whose chickens were killed understood you know, this was a very, it was a freak accident mm -hmm. because the family's been very responsive about keeping the dogs confined or, or contained. So this, if we pass this, animal control in that circumstance with the consent of the owner of the chickens, the dog was released back to the original family and everybody was happy, but this would prevent that. Well, if you want to add language that, uh, that the damaged party does not wish to pursue it, that would not apply. I may want to make some changes. That may not be it. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is anyone here to speak uh, in favor of this bill? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, Bud Clyde from the Richmond Area Bicycling Association. We didn't have anything to do with this bill with uh, Delegate Cole, but when we read it, it sounded just like an incident that we had 18 months ago in the fall of 16 uh, with the dangerous dog. The dangerous dog now is on the registry and is perfectly confined, but when it was first complained about, it was let run free by its owners, and 
went and charged some more bicyclists and, and was running loose for a period of about three weeks to a month. And we would, and you see this part in here where it stiffens it up, and that's part we would support. To get that dog off the street, the owner was willy-nilly just letting him run free and, and uh, terrorizing the neighborhood who was afraid to complain about their neighbor and, and uh, other bicycles. This was a regular bike route that many people were using. And finally we got it straightened out and the dog was in and the dog is the dog's name is Shorty and he's on the registry right now on, <laughs> on Jordan Drive in Henrico County. And that's a good place for him. And the owner has got him confined. As it says in here, under lock and key and with the fence and all that stuff. So we're supporting this this bill to the extent, I don't know about all these details that Delegate Cole has in there, but we're supporting the general concept of stiffening it up a little bit, particularly at the front end of it when when a dog is, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly how you call it, when the dog is complained about until the magistrate has the hearing and, and uh, determines that the dog is dangerous. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Cole, it's already in the code that uh, this dog, before your bill, already mm -hmm. has to be locked up. He already has or, to be unleashed. Or it has to be muzzled. Well, right. So, anybody? The, uh, the newer it's restriction is right. Well, it's, it's, <coughs> has to be securely enclosed and locked. Well, and there's a, uh, I believe, a period in the current code where until you get your enclosure confined, it, you know, it's allowed to be out with a muzzle on. <coughs> and this would, uh, my legislation would tighten up on that. I see where it has an and in there, I don't know where. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyone here? To, yes, sir. Mr. Chair, Chair for the Virginia Bicycling Federation, we also support this bill. I know I, we've had some complaints. I personally had the same situation where a dog has been uh, sighted, and in the period while we're waiting for the trial, the dog's out running and, and intimidating people and chasing. So we think this, the owners will take things a little more seriously and, uh, and control their dogs before they have their day in court. So we would support the bill. Thank you. Is anyone here in opposition to this bill? Yes, ma'am. Oh, excuse me. Uh, my name is Deborah Bruce with the Virginia Federation of Humane Societies, and we do oppose the bill. And the one thing I do want to say <coughs> is that in these incidences, if I understand them correctly, it was during the time frame when the dog was charged and when the court case was heard, well, animal control could seize that dog. They leave the dog with the family uh, at their discretion or not. If they think it's safe, they leave it. If they don't, they can seize it. So in those cases, when that happened, animal control could have taken that dog. I think I'm not a lawyer, and somebody can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, we think this bill creates onerous pre-trial and post-trial requirements on the owner of a dog who has been determined to be dangerous. It's particularly problematic to, problematic to us where last year's amendment to the dangerous dog statute just granted animal control officers necessary discretion in these cases. <coughs> the, this bill removes some of their discretion, which will likely lead to more <coughs> unnecessary pre-trial impoundment. Additionally, the bill imposes expensive and impractical burdens on owners, and the current law already provi provides sufficient restraints on dangerous dogs. We ask you to oppose this bill. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, my name is Chris Legault. I represent Nationwide Insurance and the Property Casualty Insurance Association. I just want to point out uh, a concern that they had. This re bill requires additional liability coverage. Insurance companies, if they know about a dangerous dog, they're just not going to sell it to them. Okay, so as a condition, it's sort of a hollow condition because it's going to be very difficult to obtain. <coughs> Anybody else? Okay, just got right, I'd just like to yes. point out that there's already a requirement. Of $100,000. Yeah, 100000 So, I mean, if they can't get insurance, okay. you know, after the bill or, or before the bill, I mean, yeah. I, I don't think that that argues against the, the uh, need to have insurance or bonding. Okay. Discussion within the committee? Yeah. I'll make a observation or so here. I noticed that uh, 
like the delegate said, it was $100,000, it's $300,000. It's got signs up there. Now they have to put more signs up there. Uh, sometimes it looks like if we have enforcement of laws that we already have on the books, we wouldn't need to put any more laws on the books. But anyways, um, we operate on a motion here. Mr. Chairman, yes. I move to pass the bill. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. The motion is to pass the bill by. Uh, please vote on electronic voting board. Thank you. Bill Fells report. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll get you next. Delegate Rush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, Delegate Rush, uh, I have um, House Bill 359. And um, what that what this bill does, it was brought to me by a Christiansburg police officer, canine officer. And what this does is codify um, that if a, a working dog, such as a military dog or a police dog, bites someone, there's no need for them to be quarantined um, because we know they're they're trained and they had their rabies shots and they're and they're kept in uh, good custody. Okay. Is, there any, is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition <coughs> to this bill? Okay. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this bill? Okay, committee. <laughs> 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 recommend reporting. Okay. That's okay. Rush, rush job. Any, discuss rush job. any, any, any discussion? <laughs> Okay, there's a motion and a second on the floor to uh, pass House Bill 359. Please cast your vote. Okay, second. Aye, seven, no, zero. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, members of the committee. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, this is for both my bills, I assume? 424 and 425? Yes. Wonderful. Pick, pick which one you want, 424 Let's first? Let's do HB 424 first. Okay. Got the lower number. So HB 424 is a bill that lets animal shelters vaccinate their animals upon intake. Public animal shelters take stray and homeless dogs, and it only oh, makes. Hold on just a second. second. Do we have a? Substitute? Oh, excuse me. There is an amendment in the nature of substitute. Why don't we can start there? Okay. I apologize. We're gonna we're gonna take a minute for this. So we'll okay. suspend for a minute while everyone gets a chance to look at this. Okay. Should I explain what the amendment in nature of substitute does? Let, let, let us figure right. it out first, and we'll listen to what your interpretation is. All right. Is. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the heart of the issue is whether animal shelters can vaccinate animals upon intake. Uh, public animal shelters take stray, homeless, dogs, cats, other animals, and um, the question is whether they can vaccinate them. Uh, most shelters tell me they do this, but I'm also told that Animal Control has told many shelters that they can't do this according to the code. And the reason is twofold. One is the part that's in the original bill, that's in the latter part of the bill, and that is it says that they can administer drugs, but not biological products. A vaccine is a biological product, it's not technically a drug. So this adds and biological products so that they can vaccinate uh, these dogs or, or other animals. Mm -hmm. And the other part of the bill, the parts of the amendment nature substitute, just makes it crystal clear that they can vaccinate a drug, to prevent the risk of communicable diseases, it has to be approved according to a protocol approved by a licensed veterinarian and administered by the proper personnel. The heart of this really is very simple. Uh, we don't want one dog to give a disease to other dogs, and it's really just a clarification of, of what should be in the code already. Okay. Uh, we had some questions at one time about the biological aspect of this, and uh, I think Delegate Orock, who chairs HWI, has explained it to me. 
properly. <laughs> it's okay. Which, which he says it's okay. So, uh, okay. Now, Mr. Chairman, we'll still hear public sure. testimony, but I move to recommend reporting as amended. Second. Okay. Now, now we'll, there's a motion and a second to report this bill. Uh, is there anyone here that wish to, wishes to speak against this? Okay. And I know anyone for it doesn't want to slow the train down. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, delegate, delegate Poindexter. Yes. Uh, is this just rabies or any communicable disease? Any communicable disease. Any communicable disease. Yeah. 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 It includes rabies, but um, it could be any communicable disease. Yeah. Okay, there's a, a motion to second on the floor. Is there any other discussion within the committee? Okay, all in favor of House Bill 424 as amended, please cast your vote. Okay. I 7 no, 0. Okay, the bill reports. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, members you. of the committee. And your next bill is 425. That's correct. So okay. HB 425 amends the law uh, about convictions for cruelty to animals. Uh, current law says that uh, it is a class one misdemeanor for people who torture, beat, maim, mutilate, kill any animal, willfully inflict inhumane injury or pain, some pretty, pretty gruesome stuff, and it's already a crime. Uh, one thing the bill does, just in the back, I mean, oh, I should tell you, I do have a quick line amendment that I probably should announce. Uh, it changes one word in the bill. Uh, it's uh, line amendment to line amendment 32. Why don't I get that in and then I'll finish describing the bill. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on line 32, after the word court, we would strike and unstrike to change shell to may, essentially. So basically, the... That, hold on a second. <laughs> that does an awful lot to this bill. Okay. <laughs> We're going to get the amendment before us. Move the amendment. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor of the amendment say aye. Okay. The bill is amended before us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and so the heart of what the bill does, and that basically the amendment basically brings it back to what it was in the current code. It doesn't change current code. I've unchanged my bill, which had changed it about costs. Uh, so the bill does basically two things. Uh, the one thing that I think isn't controversial at all and shouldn't be is in line 71. It says that if you've been convicted of violating this terrible, terrible cruelty to animals, uh, you shall be prohibited from the court from possession or ownership of companionship animals. Obviously, you've abused your rights as a pet owner, uh, and you shouldn't be an owner again. The other part of the bill, which is really the heart of the bill, is in lines 30 to 32. And according to current law, a court may, in its discretion, require people uh, convicted of this, this horrible cruelty to attend an anger management or other appropriate treatment program or obtain psychiatric or psychological counseling. Uh, that is in the court's discretion according to the current bill. The problem is, you're going to hear from a number of advocates, is that very, very few courts in Virginia appear to exercise their discretion to require this counseling. And you're also going to hear from some of the advocates of the clear connection between animal cruelty and human cruelty. People that shoot a dog unfortunately often end up shooting a person. People that kick a dog often end up shooting a person. That there's a clear connection between cruelty to animals, willful infliction of pain, and the kind that people do to, to humans. So what this bill does is it, instead of making it in the court's discretion, it requires uh, counseling. There's still a lot of leeway for the court. It could be anger management. It could be psychiatric or psychological counseling. It could be another appropriate treatment program unless the court finds by clear and convincing evidence that the person presents no present or future likelihood of repeating that violation of causing harm to others. The heart of it is this. If you are this cruel to an animal, um, and you know this is something that shows that there's a danger that you're going to be harmful to humans, and I'd like to bring up a number of advocates who can discuss that link. Before we hear from the advocates, could you tell us the problem we're trying to fix, specifically Give us an example of a case or several where the court has returned animals to someone who shouldn't have had them. So, so you know, tell us why we need to take this discretion away from the court system 
when we've empowered them with this uh, judgment called many years ago. So again, my advocates are going to give you lots and lots of examples. Uh, but in general, the example is that someone uh, who is harmful to an animal uh, has, has shot a dog, has later gone on and, and, and shot at people. Uh, someone who has uh, committed violence, uh, you know, done really cruel torture, and there's all kinds of examples in the press of, of some really dangerous people. Usually we find this out after the fact, that this vicious killer started out with animals. And the goal is to counsel people before they take that next step, before <coughs> they harm people. And the problem is, and again, the advocates know this way better than I do, is that courts have been loath to use this. They've been very slow to use this. And we want to encourage courts to use this because we want to prevent future violence. It's the kind of thing that can prevent future violence, whether animals or, or even more scary to humans. Okay. Okay. What we're going to do on this is we're going to try to limit testimony on both sides because we, 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 we've run through these bills many, many times before. We absolutely want to hear, but it tends to sometimes get a little bit rep repetitious. So we'd like to hear, you know, five folks from either side. And uh, so anyone that's uh, in support of this bill. Why don't I start with the Office of the Attorney General, which does okay. support this bill. Okay. Hello. Hello. I'm Michelle Welch. I'm the director of the Animal Law Unit. Um, and I serve as a special prosecutor all over the Commonwealth. I've been prosecuting animal cruelty crimes for 18 years. Um, and I would like to give you some examples of, of, a, of the link between animal violence and domestic violence and animal violence and further violence to humans. So one example is uh, a man who uh, broke a kitten's leg in front of his girlfriend. She called the uh, animal control out. They seized the cat. The next day, he killed her. He stabbed her to death. So that that link, we have never seen it quite that quickly, where they've done something to an animal and then moved on uh, to humans. We also have uh, child advocacy centers in Virginia. I know you're uh, familiar with them. And we had a child advocacy center out in southwest Virginia report that a child came home. Her newly found kitten was meowing. It was annoying her father. And he killed it right in front of her. And that child, uh, like you would believe, is having a really hard time dealing with the death of that kitten. We see, uh, as a precursor to violence, where they will often be violent to an animal in the continuum of domestic and family violence. And we see it over and over again. We had a case in Middle Virginia where uh, the woman had gotten up enough nerve to tell her abuser to get out. Um, she went off to school, and she went off to work that day. Her child went off to school that day. They came back. There was a beagle that was in her basement. That was her, her pet, and the abuser beat it to within an inch of its life, and they had to euthanize that dog. So we see it over and over again, where they often will lash out at the animal to have power and control over the victim. We also see it in school shootings. We know. Um, because the FBI is now also tracking animal abuse. I don't know if you knew that or not, but they're tracking it um, all over uh, the nation. But we know that school shooters have a component where they will often shoot animals to break down barriers then to move on. And we also know that serial killers often uh, have that in their background. Jeffrey Dahmer used to bring the children to his backyard and show them the heads on pipes. And then, of course, we all know what he went on to do to humans. So we see this continuum all the time. And in the 18 years that I've been a special prosecutor and a prosecutor for animal crimes, I've only had judges order the prohibition of animals in very serious cases. We had in Petersburg this year, we had a man who tortured three German Shepherd puppies. He fed them uh, uh, medicine, then he burnt them, then he glued their mouths shut. And that judge ordered it. But mental health treatment is very hard to get judges to do. And I think that this is a really good step in the right direction because we know that if they're violent to humans, I mean, they're violent to animals, they'll move on to humans. I don't want to take up that much right. time. I want to ask you a question, if mm -hmm. we could, on the line amendment that we had that May. So everything that you're saying is already in code now. The way that I read it. Yes, yes ma'am. The only thing that we're talking about right now is any person convicted 
convicted of violating this section shall be prohibited by the court as opposed to may as it is now right. so the only thing that we're talking about is taking the authority away from the judge mm -hmm. okay I just and i think it's important clarity. because it's very hard for me to get judges to okay. order it and 18 years is a pretty good record and i'm telling you it's really hard to get them to do that okay thank you anybody else yes sir thank you um <clears throat> I'm Deborah Griggs with the Virginia Federation of Humane Societies, where public shelters were private shelters were animal control agencies. The point I will make is uh, the burden it places on shelters. We had a case in Virginia this summer where a woman and her son moved from Roanoke to Patrick County. They were on the radar screen in Roanoke because they had too many animals. They moved to Patrick County, and in short order, there was a seizure there of about 50 dogs. Um, who then had to be sheltered until the court case played out. But my point is, if in that first incident that woman had been precluded from owning animals, we wouldn't have had to have round two. And we do see that over and over and over again. So we think this is a very important piece of legislation and we'll be, we would be grateful for you to pass it. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Matt Gray with the Humane Society. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. We support the bill for the reasons that have been stated, and I don't want to be repetitive. Uh, there is a burden here that we see every year on public animal shelters that are seizing typically large <coughs> animals. A lot of times in hoarding cases, the charges misdemeanor crimes of cruelty that don't result in the person being prohibited from owning additional animals. That's something that has a real impact on the public animal shelters. Thank you. Anyone speak in opposition to this bill? Okay, committee. The way that I see it, and I'll stand corrected, is on line paragraph G. Any person convicted of violating the section shall be prohibited by the court, as opposed to present language of may. So we're putting it in the code as opposed to discretion of the judge. So, yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, in, in all deference to the, the patron of the bill and understand the intent, uh, and, and don't under don't disagree that sometimes there are problems, I, I would suggest the committee has to look at this in the total implication of all the various circumstances that are deemed inhumane. And, and while many of them can be very egregious, that's why we have given the courts discretion, because I'm aware of circumstances where animal owner was, was away for a period the dog ran out of water for a temporary time frame the dog was not adversely impacted except they were thirsty for a while no long-term health issues but a finding was entered in that particular case the court did find them yes it was cruel but they recognized this was an isolated incident that the owner because work kept him away longer than he had anticipated and the dog dumped the water bucket when someone noticed the animal they were suffering from the heat and deprivation of water in that case does it really make sense that the court wouldn't have the discretion would have to order that individual to anger management and without also more importantly have to say and you can never again own a dog or any other companion animal the, the far-reaching implications whenever we we take away the court's discretion to consider individual circumstances we're pretty much saying Everything now fits in the same box, and there are no exceptions. Mr. Chairman, may I respond? Uh, hold on a second. Any other discussion here? Okay, delegate. Uh, yeah, a couple things here. One, there actually is in line 30 uh, for that very rare case where a court convicts someone of a misdemeanor, and I don't know whether Delegate Oryx's case, he was actually convicted of a misdemeanor, which carries up to a year of jail time for for not providing the water. But remember, this is only where there's a conviction. The court finds beyond a reasonable doubt that the person intentionally, intent is, a, is, is part of this, uh, that, that um, so, so, but even in that case, it does say that a court may, um, <coughs> if the court finds that the person represents no present or future likelihood of repeating the violation or causing himself, uh, harm to himself or others, there is still an exception in the rule. 
My goal is not to take away all the court's discretion. My goal is to say that rather than courts ordering this counseling 1% of the time, they order it 99% of the time. They have to order it unless they find they don't. I'd be more than willing to take that language in 31 and 32, the exact same language, and add 71, 72. So in the rare case where someone intentionally beats, maims, mutilates, or kills an animal, but they're not a dangerous society, the court would still have an out. But the presumption would be that generally people convicted of these awful crimes should undergo counseling, uh, with a limited exceptions that they don't. And then the last thing I would say is that this isn't just a help to society. Our goal, obviously, is to help people who might be victims of someone who commits animal cruelty. It also helps the person themselves. Uh, we find some of these people, anger management would help save their own lives or, or the lives of others. But in the case of hoarders, I've been told their main <coughs> harm is to themselves. And if we can, people who hoard 50 cats and are knee deep <coughs> in animal waste often need this kind of help. Courts are not ordering it primarily. And this would make it clear that we want them to order it unless there's a special service. Thank you, Dolly. Okay, committee. I'll move to table the bill. Is that a, is that a, is that a PBI, PBI motion? Yeah. Okay. There's a motion and a second. PBI. Any discussion? Okay. Please cast your vote on the electronic voting board. Thank you for your time, okay. Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. Okay, uh, Delegate Yancey. Delegate Yancey, you have House Bill 79. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Do you have a substitute for us? I do, Mr. Chairman. I have a amendment to make a substitute. Okay, let's get that before us for a minute. Legislation is brought before you as an incident that took place in the city of Newport News among some of my constituents in regards to a dog being boarded in the Fenway, and I'm sure many of you have seen the media coverage of <coughs> it. Uh, working with Delegate Miyars and similar legislation, we have an amendment here before you, primarily focused on paragraph D from lines 15 through 18, in which what the bill says is, is that when a dog is boarded, uh, and for the comfort of everybody in the room, when a dog is boarded at a boarding establishment, an employee of the boarding establishment shall be present at all times that the dog is able to have physical contact with another dog unless such dogs are bonded and live together according to their owner. Physical contact does not include separation by a fence or barrier. Violation of the subdivision class three misdemeanor. Which, Mr. Chairman and members, this is a finable offense, not a jail offense. And that's primarily in court what the legislation does, and there's also additional language in lines 34. Uh, where it just notes except as provided in violation section goes on to note about the, the original list in here that's in the code currently. Sure. And that's all the bill does, Mr. Chairman. Any questions of the delegate at this point? No um, questions. Jeff? Okay. Delegate Yes. Yeah. Chairman? Um, Boarding establishments. This is veterinarian's office only or private boarding establishment where somebody keeps animals on the side. 
Chairman, I'm agreeable to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, with this, you know, I'm, I'm agreeable to clarifying the language. I think the definition is clarifying yeah, enough. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Sure. Okay. We, we'd love to hear from the public again. We'd like to try to limit the testimony to not be redundant. Uh, could I have someone, anyone that wants to speak in? Hey, Mr. Chairman, if you <coughs> might help, I move to report as amended. Okay. So that kind of helps to show the predisposition of the okay. committee. Okay. There's a uh, there's a motion to report in a second. <laughs> now, knowing that public comment, anyone to speak in favor of this bill? Well, before, could you read us what the amendment actually yeah, is? Because mo most of us don't have it. Mr. Chairman, there are copies. Thank you. There's copies there. Uh, are there extras well, up here? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is not too long. Uh, Scott, would you read it for us and then say where they can see you, maybe, sir? If y'all would pay it, give attention to the clerk, please. Uh, this would add a new subsection B after the first sentence of existing subsection A, and this new subsection would read, when a dog is boarded at a boarding establishment, an employee of the boarding establishment shall be present at all times that the dog is able to have physical contact with another dog, unless such dogs are bonded and live together according to their owner. Physical contact does not include separation by offense or barrier. Violation of this subdivision is a class three misdemeanor. So, so long and the short, Delegate Yancey, the practice is, is it going to be that someone is monitoring them anyway, and this is just to codify that someone's going to be <coughs> monitoring these animals when they're able to have interaction. Mr. Chairman, Delegate Orff, that's correct. Okay. <coughs> Do we have anyone to speak in favor of this measure? Yes. Okay.
Well, I think that the uh, intent is good. I think it's a little bit ambiguous. What does presence mean? Does that mean on the facility, in the yard, or in an individual kennel with sibling dogs that are together? So I would move to remove this bill altogether just due to that. this is written to address everything you just said from um, what I could gather. Yes, but um, it doesn't remove the group size. It does. It does. Yeah. It does. It does. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Read, read what the hand is. Oh, okay. Well, you're you're going to okay. be okay. Yes, okay. okay. We're going to have to come to Richmond. Okay. okay. All right. I'll, 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 I'll give you a chance to read that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Paul here. I am your dog's best friends in Alexandria, Virginia. <clears throat> Under the present animal cruelty standards, you use the word appropriate, appropriate water, appropriate food, appropriate shelter. It seems not at all times, was a, you could have said at all times. There, I run a, a boarding where at night about 25 dogs sleep in a bedroom with a member of the staff. If the member of the staff gets up to go pee, those dogs are for that time while they're asleep alone. So. The, the standard of at all times, this would be the first time that you use it. I think it's rather inappropriate. I don't see how we can make it. Mm. <laughs> 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 if I close the door. <laughs> and we've seen it at our kennel too where they couldn't get a room with us. They went out and had a pet sitter, rover.com, what have you. Their dog wasn't handled appropriately. They weren't supervised. They went out mainly uh, or escaped their home and, and were killed. The problem with the Coastal Dog Services incident is that Animal Control, who had already responded to Coastal Dog Services once, 
hence the previous charges for them, didn't have the ability to conduct the proper investigation and actually shut that business down. They were allowed to continue. So I think the issue here, group play, granted that seems like common sense, we still allow people over the age of 16 to ride in the back of a pickup truck. So where is the place that we're telling consumers, yep, we're gonna mandate all these businesses for your safety, rather than them going out and doing the research, evaluating the daycare centers, touring them, which is, if you read the literature online, they all recommend, just as if you were dropping your kid off at a daycare, to go out and see where you're leaving your pet, see where you're leaving your fur baby, as so many people call them. So this needs to be addressed more at an animal control level to ensure facilities that aren't practicing good behaviors are actually uh, shut down. Thank you. Ms. Briggs? Yes, thank you. Um, we opposed this 79 and 94 as it was originally written for the reason that we know that play groups are a best practice for dogs in, in boarding facilities and shelters. We also feared that either now or later this could morph over to shelters. And, and we certainly did not want to see this, uh, which, is, which is my organization, we did not want to see this imp implemented at shelters. I read that it seems to be <coughs> severely, it, very much neutralized here, but I would just simply say this, that this is a very serious matter for the stakeholders, and my concern is that this amendment is so different from what everybody thought was going to be voted on that we all be given an opportunity to absorb this. I don't know what that means procedurally. We have a lot of people here that care deeply about it, and it's changed so dramatically. I just think we need time to figure out what it is. Thank you. That's fine. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, um, uh, Bilal from uh, Reserve Barking in Alexandria in Springfield, Virginia. We uh, own and operate uh, two doggy daycare and boarding facilities. Um, I think one of the things I'd like to reiterate is that the bill is in such a changed form that um, you know it's 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 really watered down from what it was initially. However, my concern with this uh, idea of, of supervision, which I don't think anybody here is against, uh, and I don't think any business model that is being represented here uh, does not uh, recommend or have constant supervision of these animals. I think that cons my concern here, and I think folks here share my concern, is that where does this then lead? Are we going down a slippery slope where now supervision becomes, uh, we start talking about play groups and all those things that were initially in the bill and were taken out, will they be reintroduced? Is this, is this opening a door to something that, that none of us want to see? Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna take two more. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to reiterate a little bit on the law, but without repeating too much. I've actually lived next to Coastal Edge, and I work in a dog daycare now and manage it. Um, the, I think there's a big problem with curtailing this legislation, or it's starting from Coastal Edge and the incident with Fenway, where 95% of the other daycares, especially as you get into the bigger areas, are not run remotely close to that. That was a house or a residential area uh, with maybe five dogs most at a day. Uh, whereas other dog, other facilities, you know, are much larger. Warehouse size has much larger dogs. I know we are far and above that. And if the original legislation obviously had uh, group play sizes that were more indicated towards that side of the business. And now obviously it's been written, been rewritten or mostly amended. I think to add to the law's point, really since it's so pervasive, the industry is so pervasive across the state, and it's bigger in almost every other retail or every other business that we should be more looking towards a collective agreement rather than curtailing this bill or this legislation to an incident that happened to spend way at one of the outliers rather than one of the uh, normal businesses that come to Thank you. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, Mother Raphael of the Plaza Hall Pet Motel and Warrington. And this is more a question for the committee than it is a, 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 an objection. We objected to the original law as it was written. It would have been a horrible situation for us and for our dogs. But with the amendment, we could live with it. The problem is, if you begin to try to regulate this, what do you do with Rover.com? What do you do with the people who are now untrained, opening their houses to board five or six dogs that are unrelated, that don't know each other, and the owners that are, are bringing them in have, 
I'm sure some of them have some experience with dogs, but I'm sure some of them don't have a lot of experience with dogs. And I don't know how you deal with that. So this is more a question to, to say, this is another <coughs> aspect of this that you need to, to look at. Well, I think we looked at it a while ago when we had the definition of boarding established. But that would put them under boarding established. So how do you regulate them? How do you even find them? <coughs> enforce them. Yeah, how do you enforce it? No, I was just going to say. Okay. Committee? I'll just check off for the vote. We have a vote to record the discussion. Well, we, we, we do. We do have yeah, just a brief discussion, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, I appreciate that Doug Yancey and uh, Doug Yannis for bringing this in, and obviously the, the situation within my district, I do everything I can to fight for it as well. I, I'm, and I've said this many times on this subcommittee, but I am probably the least uh, qualified person to speak about this because I don't have a pet. My family's never had a pet, and so I don't go to the boarding places or, or go to pet shops at all, but just from listening to this, and I do appreciate the, uh, the narrowing and maybe uh, watering down, if you will. To me, it still seems like we're using one very bad set of facts to set up, come up with new regulations, overly yes. burdensome regulations that affect everybody else, including many of the in innocent uh, businesses. And as somebody who's a pro-business person on this side of the aisle, I generally don't like to come up with new regulations unless there's absolute clear evidence that there's a violation going on rapidly. So from that perspective, I'm going to oppose this. But I, given uh, one of the folks that we just said, I, I do think that this is a kind of issue that we want to get this right, and we want to do this in a consensus way. We want to do it in a bipartisan way. So to the extent that we can give some time for our advocates to uh, listen to this and, and make sure that they can come back to us with some concerns or, or, or possibly support, I'm going to vote no so this stays on the, uh, the contested calendar as opposed to the uncontested calendar. And if you do have some concerns, please come and talk to us between now and whenever the next bill is so that we can try to further refine this. So if something, if something does go to the floor, I'd like it to be the best possible product that we can get. Okay, there's a motion and a second on the floor to pass the bill as amended. All in favor, please cast your vote. For all, please cast your vote. growing in Virginia that I think we ought to be all, all very proud of is the wine industry. Uh, I represent uh, part of Loudoun and Prince William County. Uh, in, uh, in these two counties we have over 50 wineries. And um, thank you Mr. Clark uh, for bringing this up. Uh, let me first introduce a uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute. Another one? Somebody substitutes it. if you want me to. Yes. We were originally going to use the term companion animal and we changed it back to dog once we realized that uh, companion animal included snakes. Whoa. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, the bill with uh, the wine industry which I was explaining <laughs> will allow people to bring their dog to a winery and we didn't think snakes or some of the other animals included in companion animals would be well received. So we changed it back to just dog. So you had primates and you had cats and you <laughs> had snakes and you had guinea pigs. 
and and we don't have a big enough committee room for everybody. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'd like you to substitute before. Vote to substitute. Okay. All in favor of the substitutes, say aye. 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 Okay. Substitutes before. Tell your bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Again, this is a very fast-growing industry, and one of the things we found uh, from the 50-plus wineries that are both in Loudoun and Prince William County, and over two, well over 200 in Virginia now, is people like to go and have a glass of wine and bring their dog. And uh, there was some some uh, <coughs> ambiguous uh, wording in the code, and previously people were allowed to do this, and the uh, Department of Agricultural and Consumer Services in 2016 amended regulations that took this out so people weren't allowed to bring their dogs anymore. Um, wineries were confused uh, before that, and so even today some will still allow it, some won't. Uh, so what we did is uh, this bill would actually go back and allow the dogs to, uh, wineries to allow dogs if they choose to, you'll see the word may is in there. And also uh, the wording uh, was, I would ask the, uh, the attorney if you would explain the wording because we chose this wording about the food very carefully based on the code and, and keeping it uh, coherent with the rest of the code. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, the last line and a half of the bill essentially repeat the phrase we have up above. Uh, if the presence of the animal is unlikely to result in contamination of food, food contact services, or food packaging materials. So, Mr. Chairman, what we found is that um, wineries if they have any food type at all, many of them it's only crackers and or cheese, uh, some chocolates. Uh, but the wineries, many of them don't would not allow dogs in those areas. This would give them greater uh, uh, permission to allow dog owners to bring their pet in and enjoy glass of wine. So that's what the uh, what the goal of this is. Fairly simple and really clarifying. And we believe it'd be good for for business, uh, good for tourism, uh, and it would uh, take less restrictions off. Uh, I will note. That uh, there was a, uh, I actually watched a TV report on this that was done after uh, this was started to be enforced where people couldn't bring their dogs. And several pet owners said that they loved going to the winery and enjoying a glass of wine and having their dog on a Friday evening, beautiful summer day, and that they would just sit home and, and not, not enjoy that anymore if they couldn't bring their pet with them. So it does uh, hurt business. Uh, today I've got a couple of wineries here and also the Virginia Wine Council to briefly speak to the bill. Okay. Got a question for yeah, I have a question and a possible very, very friendly amendment. And, and the reason is uh, if you read the uh, amended language, and by the way, I support the bill, so I'm, I'm going to at the appropriate time I'd like to move to the report. But if you read the language of the change, it says additionally, a dog may be allowed inside on the premises, etc. If the dog in such areas is unlikely to result in contamination, and I know this might be semantic, but uh, for, for some of us who are burdened with a law degree, this. A and a dog has a, <laughs> has a huge difference in the meetings. And what this says is that as a general policy, the Commonwealth of Virginia says a dog, meaning any dog, is allowed in this place. But on a case by case, the dog that you bring has to be that dog that's not unlikely to cause results. So if you want to set as a policy that any dog that is, is of the nature where it's a companion dog is allowed, then to not put the burden on the wineries every single time somebody walks in with a dog, you might want to change the, the line on 15 to up a dog or dogs in such area. That way, you're talking dogs generically, not the dog that the, that particular customer brings. Tell me more. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I understand what you're saying. And I was having problems with this language because as I read it, it meant for the whole winery, one dog could come in. Right. <laughs> yes. After which the door is closed. Sorry, you're first. <laughs> so to your point, well, with all due respect, I still don't like the bill, but I, I would move to amend the measure so we at least have it in the proper fashion on line 13. If we struck, and correct me if I misspeak, Scott, if we struck a dog and insert dogs. Yeah. Now, a dog is fine there, Mr. Chairman. I would support a correction on 15 to change the dog to A. A One is an alpha dog. Yes, sir. <laughs> Alrighty. Because what, the singular what? includes the plural in this case. Yeah. Lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> they stick together. <laughs> One in my English class, I'm just going to say. <laughs> my proposal on 15, strike the and insert A. Thank you. Second. Okay. Uh, everyone understand a minute? All in favor of the amendment say aye. 
see dogs in the outside refreshment area. Correct. And and one of the unit goes in and comes out with a couple glasses of wine. That allows them to enjoy the facility but still not expose the foodstuffs in that environment inside to the dog cares and, and have you all consistent with all other food service areas where we ex excluded it. Is this really the, the problem where we need a piece of legislation? Well, there, there, there are a number of wineries and several of whom are going to speak today that do want and encourage dogs in their tasting rooms. Others don't, but if you're regulated by VDACs and not the health department, then you're only selling pre-processed foods. You're not preparing foods. It, the, the foods are already packaged and sealed. So, so it's different than uh, it's different than under the health department. Um, I guess my question on this, Mr. Chairman, is um, the tasting rooms I'm familiar with are open to the bottling facility in the back. Or I mean, is there any way to limit the tasting rooms where they're separate? And the reason I say that, my background is in oysters and clams, and I'm not allowed to have a dog on the boat with me when I do that for, for health reasons. So, you know, if you have a, if the, if, the, if the counter is inside of the winery where you bottle, I just see a, a problem with, with giving you more leeway than maybe a restaurant would have or something. I'm, I'm kind of, to, to tell me Oroch's question. I, I think that would go on line 11, what you're speaking to is it says where no animal shall be permitted in any area used for the manufacture of storage. That's right. And the manufacture is what you're getting to, I believe. Yeah. That's right. Or they store the bottles in that room where you're doing the taste. Uh, so. I believe there's other wineries that want to speak to this. Kelly Bloxham, do you, you, no, you want to hold off for a minute on yeah. that? Okay. Anyone else speak in favor of the bill? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, actually, if I, if I can start real quick to answer Delegate Blossom's query. Um, my name is Brian Roder. I'm from Bear Lake Winery up in Fauquier County. Um, we have one of the largest wineries in Virginia. We're about the biggest, hello, Delegate, one of the biggest uh, uh, wineries in Virginia selling retail. As to your issue, sir, um, valid concern. What I would say is this. Wine does not spoil, and it does not, and there's no historic record of wine being infected by access to, by being, through bacteria. Um, the difference between an oyster, it can be affected by contact with things that dogs could bring into a facility. Wine cannot be. Even in the production area, due to the vinification process, there is not that form of spoilage occurring. So that is a fundamental difference. Of all the concerns on winemakers have, dogs having access to production is not one that even registers for that reason. It doesn't spoil like food does. So if I can, my prepared comments are very short. Uh, I am a, um, just so you know, I am a former past president, vice president of the Virginia Wine Association, founding treasurer of the Virginia Wine Council, past president of both the Fauquier Wine Council and the Warrington Regional Chamber of Commerce. I'm also a former member of the Virginia Tourism Council. I disengaged, thank goodness, from a lot of those things. <laughs> um, I'm here today to support this bill. Um, our expense, extensive experience with dogs at wineries perhaps can help you in your decision. Um, they said we're one of, considered one of the most dog-friendly wineries in Virginia. Put in perspective, we'll have 50,000 customers this year, and over 4,000 dogs will come through our doors. There was a query earlier about dogs being indoors versus outdoors. Five months out of the year, other than this week, it's 20 or 30 degrees outside. So if dogs are only allowed outside for the windings that have dogs, you're now precluding the ability of our customers to bring dogs during the coldest months of the year. 44% um, of Americans own dogs. Since we opened, dogs have been a key part of our success because people who own dogs like to have a place to go socialize and relax. 
They can't do that in restaurants, obviously, for reasons I'll explain in just a moment. Um, while we don't advocate allowing dogs into restaurants or food prep areas, and I don't think anybody in the industry is, uh, there are no discernible health impacts to having dogs in wineries. Any interpretation that equates wine preparation and service with food preparation and service is simply wrong. For reasons I already mentioned, but in sum, food can be infected by bacteria that are harmful to humans. Wine is alcohol, which historically is used to kill bacteria, <laughs> okay? It's a very different process. We're not talking about food preparation in restaurants. For the issue of VDAX, we've been through this personally. You have got to satisfy very stringent health code requirements that are managed through VDAX, not through the health department, <coughs> and in which, as um, Jim mentioned earlier, all of our food comes out of packaging. We're not allowed to cook anything from scratch. We can warm things, but we cannot prepare food. Therefore, we don't have the intensive food handling experience that could lead to infection. We literally dump it out of a, of a package. We used to prepare things more from scratch. We were stopped by VDAX, we accept that. Our folks still wear gloves. Any winery that is preparing and serving food is required to serve pre-prepared food. So the, while we would advocate that dogs, as part of this bill, clearly not be allowed into food preparation areas, the areas <coughs> that are being consumed, it's very much like, if you will, and I'll stop, if you order pizza and it comes to your house and you have a dog, the pizza is being pre-prepared, it's coming to your door, it's in your house, we're not trying to keep people from delivering food to people's houses. All right? Now this is a business, but the issues are very similar, I believe, because we have foods that are coming from a preparation area that is being monitored into an area for consumption and there happens to be wine consumed there. <coughs> so I do hope you'll support this bill, the discretion that VDAX now has to enforce an unnecessary and capricious interpretation of the public's health and safety by applying restaurant rules against wineries is very frightening. This is a economically important industry, and this clarification will prevent further damage, which is now occurring, as people have confusion about what wineries can do, they'll prevent further damage to our industry. Thanks. Thank you. I can answer any questions if you'd like. Now, Mr. Chairman, if may, uh, of this gentleman, Scott, if you'll listen in, is as an alternative to your language, the new language at the bottom, <coughs> wouldn't we achieve the same effect with a lot fewer words if on line 11 of the bill after <coughs> products we put comma, except in wine tasting areas, period. So it would then read, no animal shall be permitted in any area used for the manufacture or storage of food products, comma, except in wine tasting areas. One didn't want to have a dog in there. Well, I, I think leave it to the discretion of the wineries as to if they want to prohibit <coughs> any kind of animals or not. And VDAX, of course, ultimately is going to walk through every winery's door and inspect it. And if find any indication whatsoever of a problem vis-a-vis -vis the wine, the, the food production area, they will cite us. And they have the right to shut us down. That's Scott already on the way. <laughs> you got better words, Smith? Over there? <laughs> you know where I'm, where I'm headed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, mean, I, don't, I think that's for a minute. Hold on a second. Let's, 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 we're going to talk to the lawyer. Do you minute. think you got the magic words? I don't have those magic words, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I, I think if we may make it an exception to the line about manufacturing, that will imply that the winery is a place where food products are manufactured or stored. Mm -hmm. All right. Delegate Bell? I was going to say, Mr. Chairman, that I would be open to the friendly amendment, but from what you're saying, it doesn't sound like it's going to get us where we need to go. I probably need to leave it alone. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. I'll withdraw. Okay. Because okay. uh, <laughs> I, I want the doggies at the wineries. Yeah, well, I, I, I will make a little editorial comment right now that I wasn't for your bill when we had monkeys in it, you know. And I really didn't. But with that said, really, the discretion ought to be with the winery to a certain degree if we were to pass this thing on what they do and they don't want to, you know, so I'm, okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Just a question on, is there any possibility, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is there any possibility of contamination in the bottling process? That's a very good question, sir. No. What happens before the wine goes from the barrel or the tank, it goes through a filtration system, all right? And nothing of any structure, hair, uh, <laughs> dead uh, bees, nothing can get through that. So that's already been removed. But if there were anything remaining, we're filtering down to a, a, a micron level, a 
various sizes in order to make sure that doesn't get in. Uh, the spoilage rate of wine is due to factors other than the presence of animals. It occurs because of naturally occurring yeasts and naturally occurring bacteria in the vineyard that come over the grapes. So no, there's nothing that can get into the wine. Thank you. Then following up on that, Mr. Yes, Chairman, I'm, I'm going to propose on line 14, after the code site is 41207, insert period, and strike the rest of the new language. And, and the point of that being, I think, frankly, by including that language, it gives, you know, does VDAX now have to come in and see whether there may be contaminated? It, it's cleaner. This would now just say, Farm winery can allow dogs in. Period. Pretty close. VDAX does have that discretion, and they do inspect. We've been inspected three times on the last four years. But, but Mr. Yes. Chairman, to, but this would allow them to say, well, we think VDAX are coming and say, but we think dog hairs could get into stuff. So you can't have dogs. I mean, to me, you're either in or out. I propose that as, I guess, a friendly amendment. Mr. Chair, I would second that. Mr. Down. I would agree it's a friendly amendment. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. The, the amendment is a uh, motion. I would second. Read okay. that again, please. Okay. So, well, so it now just stops after 207. That's the okay. strike. That's, That's what I thought. Does everybody understand what this amendment does? Okay. All in favor of the amendment, staff? Aye. 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 Okay. Vote is locked. So, we, so a dog, the, the, the family pet of the owner can be where they're bottling. Let me let me do this for a second. Is there anyone here that opposes this bill? Okay. Move to report it. Second. Second. Okay. There's a motion on the floor to uh, report and substitute as amended. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Is anyone from VDOT to a VDH yet? Yeah? Members, I'm Dr. Charlie Broadus. Billy Poindexter may have a question for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I'd just like your views on whether there's any possibility of, con of contamination in the bottling process, the manufacturing process, or with the available food, even though it's prepackaged, if it's like by allowing dogs in water. Certainly. Uh, we think that there could certainly be contamination in the in the manufacturing process. Uh, you know, hopefully those filters are filtering out hairs, but uh, there are other uh, Waste products that may be able to go through that would go through a filter, okay. uh, so that is a that is a concern. Uh, we we don't have uh, significant concern with the the consumption of uh, or the, the presence of dogs in the area where the wine is being consumed or where it's being manufactured. Uh, we we do have that concern. With that said, we don't have a, a position on the bill. We didn't. There's no position, but that was kind of prior to some of these changes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other discussion with the committee? There's a motion and a second on the floor. Mr. Chairman, um, if I could, I know we have another winery here. And well, uh, I know it's time is up short, but. Well, I mean, I think I think you might not want to do your bill any harm. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> no monkeys. I, I, I think he'll with. understand. I won't <laughs> monkey around with Get out of the way of this. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll call the question. No monkey around. Yeah. Okay. Please vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. The other delegate bell. The other delegate bell. I just figured out he's one, he's one of three. Two other delegates. You're fine. Any way you want to be. Or it's we spend it all on a dog. Dog bills and courts. Okay. Hold on, Justin. <laughs> okay, Delegate Bell, which bill do you have? Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, House Bill 516. 
516, okay. Do you have a substitute or are you going with a straight thing? That's a first. Thank you. <laughs> Questions for Delegate Bell at this juncture? Using Bobby's word. Okay. Anyone here in support of this bill? Yes, you're fine. Anywhere you want to, it's fine. Okay, so my name is Anne Vito. I'm president of Virginia Independent Consumers and Farmers Association. I think everybody here is familiar with the kitchen bill and the exemptions that exist already. In 2014, um, we were told that people were going to get sick and die from botulism when it was made legal to sell homemade pickles. There have been no problems with that. No one's got sick and there have been no problems. So now we wanted to increase the range of products you can sell. Um, um, yogurt is basically milk that's been heat treated. You, it's lactic acid bacteria, lactobacillus strains are introduced. The lactobacteria break down the sugars in the milk and creating lactic acid, which reduces the pH, the lactic acid, and other proteins can um, control the development of various molds and bacteria. Um, there was concerns the other day from the Virginia Dairymen's Association, and he said, well, what if you've made the yogurt and then you get contamination with E. coli or um, salmonella or campylobacter or listeria? So in the Institute International Journal of Food Microbiology, survival of listeria monocytogens in yogurt during storage. Um, the cells were not detectable after five days. The pH decreased to 4.2 during refrigeration. Salmonella, Journal of, Journal of Dairy Science, February 1982. Lactic acid inhibition of salmonella in yogurt. Neither growth or metabolic activity could be initiated after cells were washed as a, in a buffer and exposed to 1.5% lactic acid. Um, the bacterial, bactericidal effect when the pH was lowered to 5.6, 5.5 by lactic acid killed the listeria bacteria. Okay, Campylobacter, Journal of Applied Bacteriology. None of the 11 strains tested survived more than 25 minutes in yogurt. The combination of the pH, the lactic acid, and the other proteins are incredibly good at inhibiting, killing, and reducing any growth in pathogens. Okay, E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus. The project was antibacterial active action of probiotic yogurt against E. coli. Conclusion, probiotic products like yogurt cause antagonistic effects against foodborne pathogenic bacteria restricting or prohibiting the growth of these path pathogenic bacteria. Results suggest that the probiotic bacteria could be used as a natural preservative in different food products. Survival of E. coli in traditional African yogurt fermentation. In the storage of fermented milk, after five days, there was resulted in complete loss of viability of E. coli. This kind of addresses the risk in yogurt. Yogurt has been made since biblical times. It's still a traditional way of preserving milk it, where there's countries without refrigeration, like in Pakistan, India, Africa, many places. This is how you preserve milk and make it safe for you to eat. Um, what else? Okay, the state vet, veterinarian department. He said that um, there is nowhere in the United States where uninspected yogurt is being sold, which is not true. Uninspected yogurt is being sold in Wyoming. They had the Food Freedom Act. It's also being sold in Maine, because in Maine, food sovereignty is local. You can, local localities can decide what laws they want to apply to food. And there's places, many places, selling yogurt in Maine, uninspected. Um, the other thing, um, here we have, oh yes, 
specific procedures must be adhered to during preparation and storage. Well, that's a recipe and using common sense. Here we're talking about a gallon at a time, two gallons at a time, you know. Um, the dairy spokesman also said that um, he could, had concerns that the meat would, milk wouldn't be heat treated enough and that in the dairy industry, they heated it to 180 degrees for 20 minutes. Well, this is like huge quantities where you might have to hold it for 20 minutes to make sure 180 degrees, 180 degrees was all the way through. If you're talking about a gallon of milk in a pot, heating it to 180 degrees, it's, and you stir it, it's reached the crucial temperature. So um, it's a safe product. People have been eating it for centuries. I don't see what the problem is. You know, it would be great if we could make yogurt um, and increase the income of people, many people living in rural areas where you have limited access to jobs and things. And this bill would apply to people. It's home kitchen, so it's not, it's urban areas and it's rural areas. So Any questions? either place is. Okay, we'll let, you. We'll let someone you. else. Okay. Hi guys, uh, my name is Susie Froze. I'm from Spotsylvania County. Um, I have four children who've grown up on yogurt since they were infants. One of them is back there somewhere. Um, I came today because one of the things that was brought up at the last meeting was the feeding of pregnant women and infants and the elderly. Well, I actually teach classes on how to make probiotic foods, uh, yogurt being one of them. And one of the things that we find about yogurt is that it actually, the process of making yogurt breaks down and makes things that the, the compromised immune system can't necessarily digest. So the bioavailability of iron is uh, increased, calcium is increased, very important for the elderly, uh, folic acid is increased, and that's just touching on three of things that we know people need. And particularly during times of pregnancy, during times of after pregnancy when you're nursing a child, and certainly when you're older and you need that calcium for your bones. So in addition to that, um, when I was doing a little bit more research because of this bill, I found that in colon cancer and in cases of IBS, um, yogurt actually is very beneficial in preventing some of the cancer cells. Um, and the T, I'm not saying this right, I'm sure, but T lymphocytes that actually cause the inflammation in IBS. So those are some things that you may not be aware of about yogurt. It is a really wonderful food. Um, why homemade yogurts? Uh, again, the economic value in the state of Virginia we think is valuable. Um, people that have very compromised children would like and do seek out homemade yogurt. I get asked for it actually quite frequently. Most people don't have time to make homemade yogurt any longer. It, the process of homemade yogurt is a longer fermentation process, which means you've got more beneficial bacteria, better breakdown in the body, more bioavailability of different nutrients that the that the little bacteria that you inoculate with actually digest in the milk and create more vitamin B12, more iron, more this, more that. So please consider this bill as a very safe food value added product to the kitchen bill. We would really like to see it on the menu. Thank you. Does anyone have anything additional to add that's for this bill? Okay, tell us something new. Okay, something new. Okay. Um, I'm Susan Burbeck, uh, Hanover County, uh, District 7. Um, Stay-at-home mom, I have a lot of children, small farm. I love cooking and making things from scratch, and um, yogurt is something I um, am grateful to be able to make for my family. Um, it has so many probiotics and the yeast that are in the air that are better than what you would get in the store, because um, it only has a few, but the yeast in your own environment are actually going to be growing, and the beneficial bacteria are gonna grow in uh, homemade yogurts. Um, very safe product, just healthy for your family. Um, if you had anybody that was on antibiotics, a homemade yogurt would be much better um, to get that good gut flora back of the, those good bacteria and yeast. And so, anyway, I would just like to have that right to um, <coughs> make it for my friends and neighbors, go to the farmer's market, and be able to, you know, meet with the consumers that want to buy my yogurt. I would like to have that right and freedom. How it was <coughs> always in the past in America, we had that um, that freedom. So as a stay-at-home mom, if I you know, want to have a little cottage business, um, I would just like to have that right and be able to share that. And it's a healthy healthy product. Um, so I would be grateful if, um, if I'd be allowed to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Like point out a question for you, ma'am. Yeah. Just in 
case something was wrong, and I drove by your house and I uh, bought some yogurt. And for some reason, one of my grandchildren became sick, and I sued you in a court of law. Um, how would you keep your farm, and how would you defend yourself? I mean, I assume you have a lot of money, but it goes beyond <laughs> just a little bit to go to court if somebody dies or gets sick in a hospital. Well, yeah, that, that is kind of part of it. That's why on our labeling, like if I made pickles, if I make my herb tea that I dry and process, you know, it's almost like, okay, buyer beware, mm -hmm. but, but my friends love my yogurt, my friends at the farmer's market. So it's basically direct to consumer where they, we have that right and they have that right to say, yes, I know that I like it's your product. So it's not like it's at Whole Foods or something and you don't well, know. Well, question point for Scott. Does that label actually prevent her from being sued? Oh, no. Acid sugar, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's why I said it's almost like buyer beware, seller beware. Uh, but this is how but it always was in America before. So this one. This one. Like to have that freedom and yes, thank you. Anyone else wants to speak in favor of this measure? Have something new? Okay, is there anyone opposed to this measure? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Dr. Charles Brodus, state veterinarian and director of the Division of Animal and Food Industry Services uh, at the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Um, and I would say I like yogurt. I've actually made it at home myself uh, and enjoyed it. But what we have the concerns with is with the, the selling uh, of it to, to people that may not be aware. At VDAX, we endeavor to balance and support our support for farmers and other food producers and processors with the obligation to ensure that the food is safe for consumption, which in turn supports the overall agriculture and food production industry. We also appreciate and support the right of an informed adult to make decisions about the food they consume. It is this independent spirit that's helped make the United States the leader in worldwide food production, and it's through partnership with organizations like ours that has likewise resulted in a safe <coughs> food supply in the world with one of the lowest rates of foodborne illness. With strong respect for the rights of the individual to make decisions about the food they want to eat, we must keep in mind the young, the elderly, pregnant women, and those with compromised immune systems who may <coughs> unknowingly consume a risky product or not be aware of the risks. We oppose the sale of unexpected yogurt for the following reasons. First, milk and milk products such as yogurt are potentially hazardous food products that are capable of causing serious foodborne illness if not processed properly. During the preparation and storage of many food products, especially potentially hazardous food products such as yogurt, Specific procedures and controls must be adhered to in order to ensure that those foods are safe for consumers. Secondly, state and federal food safety laws and regulations have been en enacted over the years in order to control the exposure of consumers to unsafe food products that can co contribute to serious foodborne illnesses and death. FEDAX believes that allowing the sale of potentially hazardous foods, such as yogurt, to consumers with no inspectional oversight uh, to ensure the product is produced safely would increase the level of consumer health risk. Third, uh, a recent survey by the Virginia Department of Health uh, informs me that no other states allow for the sale to consumers of yogurt produced in home-based settings without any inspectional oversight. I certainly may be incorrect in that, perhaps Wyoming and Maine uh, may, may be. I'm not aware of that, but uh, it's either zero <coughs> states or very few. Uh, finally, in co consultation with the Attorney General's Office, we also have several code-related concerns with the bill, including that uh, if this bill is enacted, Virginia Department of Health inspections and permits would still apply to the yogurt, even if this is enacted under the VDEX section. Uh, we also have some other concerns that the Attorney General's Office has uh, raised that we'd be glad to discuss. But in conclusion, we genuinely support the contention that an informed adult ought to be able to make decisions about the food that they eat. However, the risk with improperly processed yogurt is real, uh, especially for children, the elderly, pregnant women, and immunocompromised, mm -hmm. And it's for those reasons that we oppose the uninspected production for sale of high risk products such as yogurt. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Alan Knapp with the Department of Health. And the uh, Department of Health also opposes the bill for all of the same reasons. And I think Dr. Broadus stated it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Eric Paulson, Virginia State Dairymen's Association. The uh, Virginia State Dairymen's uh, uh, Dairymen's Association is a member organization that has been representing dairy producers since 1907. The objective of the VSDA is to represent and promote the dairy industry in Virginia. Uh, for that reason, we are opposed to HB 516. HB 516 does not provide adequate assurance that public health would be protected. As examples, HB 516 does not speak to the pasteurization status of dairy ingredients, including time and temperature, nor does it provide certainty the monitoring and verification of the level of acidity achieved in the finished product. 
Finally, nor does it prevent post-processing contamination of the product from the environment or speak to any additions to the yogurt during the process. It is impossible for a consumer to visually determine if there's any potential issues with the yogurt they need to buy. The very process of yogurt making includes a period of incubation which can exponentially raise the levels of potential dangerous organisms such as E. coli-157, Campylobacter, Listeria, and Salmonella, among others. Low, low pH does help inhibit some things, but it will not kill the product. The same reason you can get sick if something has salmonella, even though your stomach acid is 1.5 to 3.5 pH. Um, consumers place their trust in the food safety standards that are in place. We have a rapidly growing industry of small batch yogurt and other artisanal dairy products taking place in small operations across Virginia. We support those operations. These producers are abiding by the food safety standards in place, and a potential outbreak linked to these unregulated products would have a negative Im impact on their livelihoods. Yogurt is a ready to eat and represents a potentially hazardous food if proper processing sanitation controls are not applied in a consistent and effective manner. The SDA supports the regulation and inspection of the manufacture of yogurt as a grade A product. In accordance with the pasteurized milk ordinance, to remove the inspection requirements of yogurt represents an unnecessary risk to consumer safety. Therefore, we strongly oppose HB 516. Thank you. Do you want to I don't know, Dr. Broadus or Alan, you made reference to even if we passed this in regulations elsewhere, there would still have to be an inspection component. Could you elaborate on that a little more? It, it's part of it depends on what's considered to be under a home-based uh, type of a scenario. But the health department does regulate the production of yogurt uh, throughout without any separation of where it's, where it's produced. Well, Mr. Chairman, our, our analysis is that even if this bill were passed in this form, the regulatory requirements for grade A milk would still apply. And so this would not exempt a person from having to get a permit under the grade A uh, milk and milk product regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here opposes this bill? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Jonathan Harding from Virginia Agri Business Council. We are also in opposition to this uh, legislation. Um, the council opposes the unregulated and uninspected sale of meat and meat products, dairy and dairy products, and other potentially hazardous foods as defined um, in the FDA code. Um, I'll also just echo the comments of Eric of the Virginia State Dairy Association in regard to it uh, being a food safety issue. Thank you. Okay. Just, uh, don't, we've already heard, just kind of tell us if you oppose and who you represent, if you would, unless you have something very new to add. No, sir. Stephanie Kitchen, Virginia Farm Bureau, we also oppose the bill. Jason Carter, Virginia Cattlemen's Association, and we also oppose the bill. Okay, tell you that. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's not the first time we've heard this issue, so yes, congratulations. So the two groups, those that want to eat the yogurt and those who don't, the difference is the people that want to eat the yogurt aren't trying to tell the people that don't what to do. The people that don't want to eat it are telling the people who do what it is what they want to do. You've heard the issues properly before you. Right before this came up, the chairman's question was brought to our attention that this committee subcommittee was so inclined they liked the idea, then obviously mm -hmm. the work of the details, but I told the advocate I doubted there was a consensus on the subcommittee to move forward, and therefore I didn't think that line amendments and substitutes would take five percent. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. appreciate the committee. Oh, thank you, Dominic. Committee? Yeah, I guess. I move to TB out of the bill. There's a motion to PBI of the bill. Any discussion? Okay. The motion will be at fourth before us. Please vote on electronic voting board. It's a motion to PBI. Okay. Mr. Kirk? Aye. Five, no's three. Okay. The bill fails to report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your time. Is there any, Thank you. any other business? Okay. Please adjourn. Thank you.